This video is going to go through a nonlinear consolidation code that I developed and made available online at the UCLA Geo website. So first the URL is uclageo.com slash consolidation. As you can see here, if you go to that website, you will come to uh, this page right here. Let me put this back to full screen. Uh, okay, and then it shows uh, a figure from the paper um, that has the uniform clay deposit, specific gravity, C sub C, C sub R, and C alpha are constant, 100% degree of saturation, and then we have either the OCR, the void ratio, or the maximum pass pressure being constant there. On the left panel, <clears throat> you'll see uh, some input fields. So you could put in the uh, virgin compression index here, C sub C, C sub R. Um, there, those are pretty common input parameters that uh, users should be familiar with at this point before getting to this um, website. Some of the other, oh, same thing with specific gravity of solids here, right? G sub S, everyone should know what that means. Um, these two reference uh, parameters, reference pressure and reference void ratio, require a little bit of explanation. So the um, reference pressure and reference void ratio are the coordinates of any point lying on the normal consolidation line. Okay, it turns out it's not adequate to just say what C sub C is and what C sub R is. You need to know where the normal consolidation line is in E log sigma V prime space because it defines a yield surface. And if you're on the left side of that yield surface, you're going through elastic deformations following the C sub R line. If you're on the yield surface, you're going through plastic deformations following C sub C. Okay, so that's compressibility properties. Then there's also permeability properties. There's a reference permeability, K ref, and a reference void ratio, E K ref, and then the coefficient of permeability variation, C sub K. So this is the slope of the line, C sub K, in, in E versus log K space. And K ref and E K ref denote a single point on that line again. So any point along that line, it doesn't have to be at a particular void ratio or at a particular permeability. Uh, it's just the equation of a line here in E log, sigma, or log K space. <clears throat> For secondary compression properties, there are two types of input that users can select, either basic or advanced. Let's go through basic first. If you select the basic option, the secondary compression index is entered here and the time at the end of primary consolidation is entered here as well. Okay, what this does is assumes that the reference secondary compression line from which you're computing the secondary compression strain rate is exactly the same as the normal consolidation line. It's probably the simplest assumption that can be made and is um, probably the most common way that users will choose to input their uh, parameters into the code. Um, if you go to advanced, you get a few more options here. Um, you still input C alpha. Now instead of TP, you have to input some reference time T ref that's the time associated with the reference secondary compression line and then you have to enter the void ratio and vertical effective stress that lies on any point on the reference secondary compression line uh, so that's a little bit more complicated that was really intended for us to model uh, resetting of secondary compression behavior that arises from uh, cyclic loading of peat so it's, it was a little bit complicated to try and input the parameters using the basic feature. So we implemented this advanced feature because what we found is really interesting. It's that the reference secondary compression line actually might move down as a result of cyclic loading. That means that the secondary compression behavior speeds up. And we would model that just by moving this E sub C alpha ref number down. But anyway, that's a little bit more advanced. I think uh, if you want to understand these parameters a little better, you can go to the paper and uh, read about those input parameters. I'm just going to click this back to basic here for a demonstration. OK, moving on to the last input uh, set here, you have the height of the layer, right, H. 
Uh, notice that H is not the drainage path length here. Um, technically, the drainage path length can't really be defined for a nonlinear soil because the pore pressure isochrones are not symmetric anymore, and the drainage path length actually may evolve with time. So this is just the layer thickness, not half the layer thickness if you have drain free drainage at the top and the bottom of the layer. We have some initial overburden pressure. In this case, I'm putting on 10 kPa, pretty small amount of initial overburden. Then you have the change in vertical pressure. And here I'm putting in 100 kPa. So we have a pretty big load increment here. Um, if you think of load increment ratio as being delta Q over Q naught, then this is a load increment ratio of 10. During a typical laboratory consolidation test, we have a load increment ratio of 1 where we're doubling the weight, right? Delta Q is equal to Q naught. There's also this other field here, initial excess pore pressure ratio. Uh, that's set to a default value of zero. Uh, again, that's a field that we put in because uh, we're de we developed this code to study the influence of, of cyclic loading on the pore pressure generation and secondary compression behavior of peat. So if you take a, a column of peat and shake it at the base, um, there will be some shear strain in the peat, and it may build up some excess pore pressure. And then we were looking at studying what happens after shaking stops, after the earthquake ends, and uh, how much is the soil going to settle. So we do have this field where you can input an excess pore pressure ratio. Now, uh, by default, the delta Q that you enter is going to all go into... Um, pore pressure initially. So if you want to just model the pore pressure change that comes from a total stress change, leave R sub U at zero and just put delta Q in. For the problem I mentioned, where we're having a 1D column that maybe is shaking during an earthquake and building up some pore pressure, delta Q is actually zero for that case. Okay, there's no additional vertical total stress that's being placed on top of the soil. It's just developing some pore pressure during shaking and that's like an internal pore pressure that happens that's when you would put in a pore pressure ratio that's non-zero and delta q might be zero also if you wanted to do an unloading stage you could actually make delta q negative as long as you don't end up with a negative uh, total stress overall so q naught plus delta q has to always be larger than zero Okay, now moving down, we have this uh, little drop-down menu, and this is where you can say whether the OCR, void ratio, or maximum pass pressure is constant for this particular soil. Let's keep it at OCR, and uh, we'll do a normally consolidated clay. So OCR is 1 initially. So this is a pretty highly compressible soil profile. Very low initial overburden pressure, very high change in pressure. OCR is 1. This one's going to have quite a bit of settlement, probably. Okay, the number of elements uh, by default is set to 100. The number of time steps is also 100. Um, the defaults generally work okay, but there may be problems where you want to change these. Uh, especially if it's not converging, you'll get a little error message pop up, and you may have to use more time increments to get it to converge. Okay, this field here is the maximum amount of time for which you want to run the analysis. So be careful with that input. Uh, you want to be sure to set that to be a reasonable number relative to the problem that you're solving. If you're solving a really thick clay layer that's going to take hundreds of years to settle, you're going to have to make this maximum time pretty big. Right now, unfortunately, it's only... Uh, possible to enter that number in seconds. I, I haven't implemented different units yet, so you'll have to do some conversion and put a number in here in seconds. Okay, then there's a convergence tolerance. So the way that the nonlinear code works is that we're using the finite difference method, I'm using a midpoint rule and performing newton raphson iterations to make a residual term as close as possible to zero. And that term, the absolute value of the residual has to be less than this convergence tolerance in order for the program to say that that's a good solution. Okay, and then you come here and there are three different options for drainage boundary. You can have double drainage, that means zero pore pressure at the top and bottom. Single drainage through the top, that means that the bottom is an impermeable boundary and all the flow goes up. Or single through the bottom, that's where the 
uh, all the water flow is, is vertical down. You might be wondering what kind of boundary conditions would result in single drainage through the bottom. Well, it turns out that it's not that uncommon. If you imagine that you have a uniform clay layer here with an aquifer underneath, and that aquifer has the water table pumped down so that it's now below the bottom of the clay, that would be a condition where you have single drainage through the bottom, right? You have perched water in the clay that's going to flow down as the clay consolidates and eventually end up in the aquifer down below. I'm going to leave this on double. Okay, now uh, you can click this button here to save the input parameters. Um, here I'm going to push this and a little dialog comes up and it asks you for a file name. Uh, I'm going to open it in Notepad just so you can see what it looks like, but you could save this to your local directory if you want, and then you can come back and load it later so you don't have to re-enter everything. Uh, so the the input files are um, in XML format. The, the XML structure doesn't show up too clearly in uh, Notebook and Notepad, but anyway, there's data so an open data tag here and a closed data tag there and then all of the input parameters are included uh, right in here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and save this. Uh, let's see, I'll just save it right to my desktop as iconsoleinput.txt. I already have one there but I'm going to replace it. Alright, now let's come in and change an input parameter. Uh, let's say that we have void ratio here and it's 2. What I'm going to do now is, is browse up here and load that, um, that file that I just saved. Let's see if I have a lot of stuff on my desktop here. I can solve input.txt. That's the one that I just did. So uh, I changed the OCR but didn't change the uh, number. I'll put it manually back to one. There's a bug. I need to go through and work on that. All right. Anyway, that, that feature should be fixed by the time you actually watch this video. Uh, okay, then when you're ready to actually see the results, you just push the compute button and it'll run for just a second. It doesn't take too long and you get settlement versus time. Notice that it has a nice secondary compression behavior to it. Uh, the plotting is all done using a program called Plotly, which is a pretty cool little JavaScript API that results in um, interactive plots. So when you hover over, you can see individual values here. Notice that there are 100 time steps in this particular plot, and you can get settlement, and you can get time. So at 1.908517 million seconds, the settlement was 0.654 meters, right? Uh, you could also, I, I've enabled um, you to change the units here, so if you want to go to years, you just click years, and then boom, you've got it there. Go back to seconds. Um, okay, now here are pore pressure isochrones. Um, and the, the program picks those automatically for you based on the settlement versus time plot. So here's the first isochrone and you can again flow through and then if you jump down to the orange one, Plotly will tell you that you're looking at that um, orange one by, by putting that little flag on there. If you want to zoom in, uh, let's see, there is a Uh, here we go, zoom in button. And so you can zoom in and really see what's going on. You can pan around inside here if you want to. And then when you get tired of that, you can push the uh, home button and it'll reset it back to the original um, axes. There's also a zoom window button here. So if you wanted to just look at that part of the data, boom, there you go. So it's nice and interactive. I'm going to go back to home. There it is. Uh, you can also save a PNG if you want to. Um, you can save it in the cloud if you have a Plotly account. So if you click this Save button, it'll ask you to log into your Plotly account. If you're interested in understanding more about it, you can click here too because this will take you to the Plotly website. All right, so there's excess pore pressure. I'm also plotting vertical effective stress isochrones. So we're starting here and then moving to a condition there with the final vertical effective stress. And uh, we're also showing void ratio here, too. So these are plots of the void ratio versus depth. Okay, now um, there is a feature here where you can plot it with the initial depth scale. So the layer was initially 4 meters thick. Of course, it's settling, though, by 0.8 meters by the end of consolidation, which means that these plots are technically not correct because the ground surface has moved from here 
all the way down to here. So for example, this green, or well, let's just pick on this pink isochrone right there, right? The settlement at that time might be half a meter, yet we're showing the isochrone all the way to the top. And that's because we're, we're visualizing it based on the undeformed geometry or the geometry before settlement happens. So if you click on this button and push deformed, okay, now it's updated all of the isochrones so that the top is actually at the depth where um, that corresponds to the time at which that isochrone is, is plotted. So these plots look a little bit funny. I, I don't know if you would prefer to look at them this way or initial, but I figure that uh, it's best just to give you that option so you can do it either way. Now you can export the output as well if you'd like to have the data stored in a text file format. Uh, the options available for output are settlement versus time, uh, the plotted pore pressure isochrones, which means 10 of them, right? We're looking at 10 different isochrones here. You can do the plotted void ratios. That's uh, these ones over here, the plotted nodal depths. Um, so that will give you the, um, uh, the depths corresponding to each isochrone. So you could reproduce the deformed plot if you want. And then uh, it'll give you the plotted effective stresses. So that uh, 10 isochrones for this one too. Um, just know that when it says plotted, it's only going to give you the 10 data points that are plotted here, but this is only a subset of the solution, right? We actually analyzed 100 time steps. So you could get all of the pore pressure values, all 100, or you could change that to 1,000 time steps and then get all 1,000 time steps and make a really continuous plot. So if you check those boxes, you'll get all of them, not just the 10 that are plotted, but all 100 or 1,000 or whatever you pick for the number of time steps. Then when you push export output, uh, it'll give you an output file that's a text file. Here's settlement versus time. It's a comma separated value file, so you should be able to copy this and paste it into Excel if you want to use Excel to plot, or you can use MATLAB or whatever you want to plot the data. There's the pore pressure isochrones and, and so forth. Um, the times uh, corresponding to each isochrone are always provided as a row vector right at the top of the uh, data file. All right, let's do, um, let, let's just play around here and, and see what happens with some different features. So if I set the secondary compression to zero and compute it again, okay, you'll notice that we're only getting about 0.6 meters of settlement at the final um, time step here. We had 0.8 before. So we are getting an effect of secondary compression happening during primary consolidation here. Let's set the OCR to be, say, 4. So now we're starting out with an overconsolidation ratio of 4. We're still going to become normally consolidated because uh, the, the change in pressure is so big compared to the initial pressures. But if we compute it, you know, now you see that there's some real uh, distortion of these isochrones happening with depth. The settlement versus time plot still looks nice and continuous, but the isochrones look a little bit funny. And the reason is that these ones up here are becoming normally consolidated, whereas maybe down here they're still over consolidated and then, you know, eventually they would become normally consolidated too. So that's where the nonlinear parts of the consolidation uh, can really cause the solutions to deviate significantly from Terzaghi's one-dimensional consolidation solution. And the uh, the void ratios are starting, you know, at some line here and then eventually moving to something like that and eventually a straight line down like that. Uh, okay, and then we could do also constant initial void ratio. Let's make it like uh, 0 0.6 or something like that. We'll compute Okay, now we're getting very little amount of settlement because this basically conforms perfectly well with Terzaghi's one-dimensional consolidation um, solution. Well, I, I should say it, do, it doesn't conform perfectly well, but it's close, right? We're getting a small amount of settlement because it's over-consolidated. It's only moving along the uh, recompression line now because this void ratio is, is really small. Right? We could get the same kind of behavior if we make the OCR really big, like say 100, and we compute it. Okay, same amount of settlement there, right? The void ratio changed, but we're getting something that's similar. These isochrones all look really similar to Tuzagi's one-dimensional consolidation solution now. 
So uh, if you have a problem that doesn't involve significant settlement, uh, you end up with something that really is a lot like Terzaghi's 1D theory. If I were to make the change in stress even smaller, it would look pretty much symmetric. I bet these lines fall right on top of Terzaghi's theory. You can see very little change in effective stress, very little change in void ratio. What that means is that the permeability and compressibility are basically staying the same, and Terzaghi's theory is a good approximation of this problem. Okay, now there are conditions where you can cause the program to crash. So be aware of these. Like if I make the initial void ratio 5, uh, I, I bet that this will fail to run. Okay, what I've done is made the initial void ratio be above the uh, normal consolidation line. Remember, you can't be above or to the right of the NCL. The current stress condition that you put in here must be on or below the NCL. If you put a stress condition above it, it's going to cause the program to crash. Also, if you run a tiny number of time steps, let's put the, this back to OCR1. Um, if, let's say we've tried to do this with 10 time steps. Well, it actually did run. It just didn't produce a very good solution. You can see these isochrones are pretty bad so if you see things that are funny like this with isochrones oscillating back and forth maybe try increasing the number of time steps i think 100 is usually okay and it runs pretty fast so there's no real reason to go uh, reduce the number of time steps even if we put a thousand time steps and compute you know it, that was pretty quick right there the solution looks like it might have changed a little bit but all that happened is that the time associated with these isochrones changed slightly the solution for 100 is almost identical to 1,000. Okay, well, I hope you enjoy playing around with this code. Uh, hopefully it's useful. There are some limitations. It, it won't handle layering. It won't handle a loading condition that varies in time. Those are both things that uh, may happen in real life. It also won't handle um, stress attenuation with depth that might occur for a two-dimensional or three-dimensional loading condition. But it is nevertheless a useful program for studying the combined effects of nonlinear consolidation and secondary compression.